Well, good morning. Our first real spring day, I think. Summer's on its way. Hooray. We'll be having the hangar doors open and fresh air blowing in. It'll be so nice. Thank you so much for being here on this great April morning. Uh, we've got a really wonderful um, event this morning to talk, a great speaker. We all know John Hug. It's going to be quite fascinating. We're grateful to him for coming here and sharing with us. First, I'd like for uh, us to stand up and say our Pledge of Allegiance. So where is our great leader? Here he is. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, with liberty, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Okay, I want to once again, I do this every single time because it's so important to thank our sponsor today, that would be Clover, Cloverdale. Is anyone here from Cloverdale? So wave your hand if you are. You usually are. Well, we are so grateful to them. They love this group and love to help sponsor, and, and so does Treasure Valley Coffee. So we love you like your coffee, but let's be sure to thank uh, Treasure Valley. So let's give them an applaud for supporting this event. They are so awesome every single time. Of course, without those wonderful volunteers, and would you please all stand, because some of you are sitting down just to listen, please stand, the volunteers that make this happen. Raise your hands, please, all of you that are volunteers here. What a great group. They get here really early in the morning. Sometimes they get here tomorrow, yesterday when we're closed and start setting up just to get this ready for all of us. So we really want to thank them. Um, the Vietnam uh, Symposium, our first one, was on Saturday, the 28th of March, and we thought it went very well. We were all kind of nervous wrecks because we'd never, we've never done anything like this before. The, um, all of the men that were uh, on the committee to create the symposiums were all but two were there too. Too, and uh, we're going to have our meeting today after this to just review the morning. I felt it was incredible. Over 650 people came. We were just kind of blown away by it. So we hope that we'll have as big a crowd uh, coming the rest of the series, which is uh, we have all those posted, and we've got um, all that we've got the. Um, uh, the series in here. You can take the uh, the paperwork on it if you'd like to, and. Uh, and uh, be sure to mark it on your calendar and try to come. It's really quite incredible, and these guys have done a lot of work. So uh, I want to thank all of them, and those of you that were there know that you know a lot of hard work went into that. Um, you know what we're going to do now? We're going to see who's new here. Now, it's, um, it's a rule here. You can't be shy. You won't last very long if you are. But since most of you are military, at some point, I don't think you are shy. So let's raise your hands if you're new and meet you. Heather's going to be coming around. Don't be, don't be afraid. Stand up. Stand up. All right, sir. Thank you. This is Fred. Uh, my name is Fred Harris. I've been here in Idaho for two years now, still learning my way around. And this is my first event. And it's nice to be around a bunch of veterans. It really is. Because while I was near Seattle area, didn't have it. Just didn't have it. Thank you. Well, we hope you'll come every time. Right. Thank you for your service. And we do this the first Tuesday of every month, rain or shine. We are all here. And Heather's going to be giving you a bumper sticker as a new guest. And uh, she's also going to give you an envelope that's our Veterans History Project program at the museum. Those of you that have already had that done, I know this sounds very repetitive, but it really is so important that I say it every time. Those of you that have not come here, and a lot of you that come to this event has, still have not come in. Uh, and allowed us to preserve your histories on film. It's, we are partnered with the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. to preserve your histories on film, your story told your way. And so if you would just take the envelope Heather will give you, or we keep them up at the front desk all the time, um, for those of you that don't need a, a new one, um, and sign up and come on in. It's a great experience. Who's, who's had it done that would give us a testimony? Yes, sir. Dave definitely had it done. What an experience that was. I came here and this young lady gave me an interview and 
we recorded it. I took it home and watched it. Wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I just want to say that I'm just proud to be involved with this project because my children ask me, Dad, what did you do in the war? And for the most part, I said nothing. You know, I came home. I had five fingers on the top side and five toes on the bottom. I felt I was okay. But guess what? They wanted to know. And this record shows them what I did. My daughter's already asked for extra copies. She wants to give it to her friends. I was touched through the interview. I really was. Because it really makes a difference when you sit down and put together your thoughts about what it was like. Now, my thoughts and the thoughts of the people that made the movie Bravo are not the same. I didn't go through that. But what I went through was important to me and to my children. And now I have a legacy to pass on to them. It was a great idea. Thank you so much. And that's the truth. That's how everyone feels after they've had this done. Uh, we had one gentleman who'd never told his story. And, um, and it doesn't have to be you know, something where you're actually in combat. It's just you served our country uh, during a time of war. And frankly, this country has been in, in a time of war since 1945. So it really counts any time. Um, and it's your, as you said, it's your story. It's not Hollywood's version of, of, of that period of time in which you served. So please, please do it. It doesn't cost anything. It's an honor for us to do it. There are a number of volunteers who do the interviewing and the filming and the editing. And so please make it a, a part of your life. Yes, Everett. I, uh, I had this done too. And, uh, once I haven't had it done up, I suggest that you make prepare, uh, preparation, right? Sort of make notes of what you've done and before I had this done, and it makes it a lot easier and a lot easier for the, the people that interview you, too. Thank you. Okay, is this someone new? Okay, sir, thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Dan Savino. Um, I moved here in 2004. Uh, from California, been here for 11 years now. Absolutely wouldn't live anywhere else. Would it, wish I'd have found it eons ago. I met this young man over here, my very good friend Bruce Wright, about that time. So I've known Bruce for quite a while, and now I'm involved with the employer support of the Garden Reserve. Um, I was in, in Nam in 68, but I was one of the fortunate ones. A lot of my friends did not have the fortunate luck that I had, something that I guess we all carry, as you gentlemen and ladies know. Um, but it's, it's, been, it's been wonderful, and Bruce now uh, said, well, you gotta come out and, and join us and meet the, meet the folks. So I'm here, and um, um, I, a, little, a little quick story. Um, I have a an 18-year-old grandson that's graduating from high school here in CUNA. And he said, you know, Papa, he said, I think I want to go in the Navy. Well, boy, that's all I had to hear. <laughs> I was in the Air Force, but uh, now he's got accepted into the Naval uh, Nuclear Program. And uh, he's a pretty smart guy. He's pretty cool. He was over at the house last night, and I'm just so happy about that, so delighted that, um, you know, our young people are are following in our footsteps and I'm sure you all have a lot of family and friends and so forth that are doing the same. So I thank you for uh, your service, your dedication and your love to not only our country but to each other and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. We hope you'll come every month. How many um, Folks are here, served during Vietnam, I mean during World War II. Let's start with World War II. Could you raise your hands? Look at all that. Look at that huge group. Are any of you new here today? Has anyone not been here from World War II? Yeah, we're going to get you. Well, I'm so happy you are such a dedicated group of guys. You mean so much to us. How about Korea? How many... Do I have a new one from, Viet from World War II? Where? Oh, look, they're all pointing at you. 
Well, he's Korea, too, so he'll take in both, and Vietnam. World War II, Korea and Vietnam? World War II. Could you stand just for a second, sir, so we can all meet you? All right, you can take your time. All right. Tell us your name, sir. Kennedy, Paul. Paul Kennedy? Yes. Nice to meet you, sir. Do you live here locally? What's that? Do you live here I'm locally? hard to hearing. So am I. Let's just, let's just scream at each other. <laughs> what division of the service did you serve in? What did I did? I went in the Navy in 1943. So I've been around a long time. Well, you don't look it. Yeah, you look pretty young. Actually, you look younger than me. Hmm. Okay. Where did were you? Did you serve overseas? Were you overseas? Yeah, the South Pacific. I asked in there one time if there's anybody from the South Pacific. Nobody stood up. I was. On, That's because they can't stand. Off the equator for two years, and uh, so. I'm an old timer, really. We hope you'll come here every single month. We want you to come and be our guest. Thank you for your service, sir. How about Korea? How many guys are here, men or women from Korea? Raise your hands. Awesome, look at this group. And how many have never been here before? Once, Larry was here once. How about over here, any new ones from Korea? Well, thank you for continuing to come. It's such an honor to have you here. Um, and we hope you'll always come back. How about Vietnam? How many are here from Vietnam that served in Vietnam? Wow. Those, uh, those of us that, uh, those World War II veterans especially, remember when we first started this, there were no Korea over, or a few Korean, but no Vietnam veterans here at all. That's a real honor that, that the increase in, in your attendance is just so awesome. We're very proud to have you here. How many new ones now? I know back here, you, are you new? My name's Lawrence Olds. Uh, oh, okay. Um, my name's Lawrence Olds. Uh, I've been here since May of last year and uh, come from Texas, originally from Michigan. And I tell you one thing, I love uh, the weather here. It's, it's awesome. I mean, snow for two weeks before Thanksgiving, but, you know, I can get over that real quick. But, uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm really overwhelmed with this place. I figure a city this small and... Uh, just with it, it's amazing. So and just seeing everybody together and stuff like that. Tell us where you served and what. what oh, the army uh, for base, uh, the army uh, since 1981 or 1980 to 1991, and during peacetime was over in Korea, uh, DMZ border patrol because we had the Olympics and all that stuff there. So we had to keep watch on that, but. And uh, that was about it. So I just missed the uh, Gulf War because uh, we were on standby. I was in reserves at that time there in uh, Lansing, Michigan, uh, through a howitzer battery. But they just took the howitzers and not us. But now that's a different story nowadays, as we know. So, but that's about it. So, yeah, thank you. Oh, we hope you'll be here every first of the month. Yeah, I know you did a great job, a great job. Who else is new here? Right here, and then I'll work, I'll work my way back there. This is Dave. Hello, uh, Dave Taylor, uh, U.S. Navy, 1977 to 83. Served six years on USS Enterprise in reactor operations, reactor propulsion engineering. So. Do you live here locally? Yes, I live out in Greenleaf. Been in Idaho about two years. Uh, California political refugee. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> How many of those are here? <laughs> Thank you. Well, we hope you'll be here every single month. All right. Who else is new? Okay, back here. And please, please do follow through with the Veterans History Project envelopes that you, that you are being given. Those of you that are new here, it's so important for us to preserve your, the truth of your history. Yes, and this is Bill. Bill, yeah. Right, right, right okay, yeah. <laughs> Well, I've lived in Boise uh, four years. I've got 19 great grandkids here. 
I served in the tail end of World War II. I didn't have a chance to get shot at. Well, I did have a couple of chances, but I didn't take them. <laughs> <laughs> I was signed on a ship to go at the tail end of the war when they were uh, crossroads experiment and stuff like that. And I signed up for it, but they didn't take me, <laughs> fortunately. But uh, I love Boise. I've got 19 great grandkids here, and that's why I'm here. <laughs> and I think that's what keeps me here. I was 88 uh, a few days ago, and so I'm still trying. If my picture isn't in the paper every day, I know I'm all right. <laughs> right. Uh, well, we'd love for you to bring those 19 grandkids here, but one at a time would be perfect. <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, another. Oh, great. Yes, sir. I think you're Viet. You're a veteran. Your hat says so. Could you stand just for a moment so we can meet you? <laughs> okay. And your name is Wilbert. Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you live here locally? Yep. <laughs> you know, you ought to see me do a Veterans History Project interview with a guy like this. So you served when? Mm-hmm. When did you get home? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about you, sir. Well, I was in Nam for five, five months, and I was in Japan for two months, and Korea for seven months. What, what years did you serve? 68 and 69. And uh, I'm one of them that got drafted, and when it was time to go, I took it. <laughs> I couldn't go to Canada. It's not, I'm not a coward. <laughs> So we're sure glad you're here. We uh, hope you will come back every month, the first Tuesday of every month. And thank you for your service, sir. Yes. Over here. Anybody else back here? Yes. Oh, sure. OK, Chuck. My name is Chuck Hawkins. I was in the Army 63 to 66, spent 13 months in Panmunjom, Korea with uh, United Nations Command and seven months uh, in Okinawa with Armed Forces Police. All right. Thank you, sir. When did you move to Boise? I've lived in Idaho all my life, and I moved to Boise in 98. Well, thank you. We hope you'll be here the first Tuesday of every month. Anyone else back here? This is great. It's so nice to have so many new people. Okay, I'll work my way over here. Anyone over in this area? No, I know all you. You don't get to do it twice. Yes, sir. This is Mark. Um, yep, Mark Swinney. So I've kind of hearing what other people are talking about. So when you got to Boise, um, hopefully I said that right. So I'm a native, almost native uh, Texan. So don't hold that against me. Any Cowboys fans amongst us? Yeah. All right. Couple, two or three. Oh, New York Giants, so see. He's already got my number, and hopefully he doesn't have any Marine Corps training or Army training, because I'll run to the car, because in the Air Force we like air conditioning and heating. And <laughs> so, um, 1987, uh, fresh out of high school, did a little service um, that doesn't count, I guess, uh, for four years in Colorado Springs, and then um, on the Air Force side, uh, my latest job's been in intelligence and military intelligence, as you guys know, don't belong together, right? Yeah. So, um, but uh, now I work for College of Western Idaho uh, with my full-time gig, and um, I'm trying to fill some really large shoes of Cheryl Boyce, who did kind of our veterans reach out um, and was real involved, I think, with you guys and your group and the Warhawk Museum. And I love planes. My dad flew C-130s in Vietnam and spent some time, I think that was called at the time, the Belgian Congo. And he has all sorts of stories to tell. And because of him and my mom's stories and a little movie called Top Gun, I thought it might be a good idea to be in the Air Force, which there's one over there. I see the emblem that is no longer part of the Army Air Corps. We're our own thing now. So. And I um, just uh, feel honored to be amongst you guys. Uh, quick war story, I never got shot at. Only the people who fly the planes in the Air Force get shot at and a few others. But um, I found myself in Uzbekistan, which is just north of Afghanistan. 
and my combat experience is jogging around the base because that's what Air Force guys do when they're deployed and uh, and uh, some use Becky farmer kids lobbing dirt clods over the fence <laughs> and it's like you know I don't know how to do incoming with artillery rounds and dive for cover that's foreign to me but uh, I reported it to our security forces detail there and they're like just go take a shower in your tent and those are farmer kids which we have here in Idaho and uh, they didn't mean no harm they just enjoyed watching you dodge their their dirt clods so um, came I'll try to be quick it's not and so part-time um, this weekend do service with the guard and a10s if you like the mighty a10 I know we're trying to keep it around but chances are really good that we get to move into an F-35, which is a cool plane. But a lot of pilots who love the A-10 and Army folks who love the A-10 and their 30 millimeter bullets covering them don't necessarily want to lose it. But I got to work this weekend, and thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Well, we hope you're here the first Tuesday. Tell them over there at the college you can't be there on Tuesday, the first Tuesday of every month. Yeah. Well, now, wouldn't you love to take a class from him? Are you a teacher there? Excuse me. You're in the Air Force. You should be paying attention. Yeah. No. Larry goes, no, Air Force. So do you teach at the college? Um, they did not trust me teaching a class yet. Okay. So I work in uh, workforce development, and we provide workforce training. So if you know of anybody that wants training in welding, apprenticeships, or companies that are out there that need this kind of training, we can provide it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Anybody else over here? Okay, that is so awesome. Well, it's, I will tell you once more, those of you that haven't joined the membership of the Warhawk Air Museum, we hope that after today you'll consider doing that. It's a great family to belong to. Those of you that are, how many of you here are members? put you on the hot spot there. Great. It's a good membership, isn't it? And so we're really happy to have all of you here, and I hope that... Yes? Oh, okay. How many folks here served in Desert Storm? Wow, we're getting up there now. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, and uh, how about the current conflict? Anyone here that has served in that? Wow, that's great. We're getting you young guys in here. Well, thank you so much, all of you, for your service to this country. It is, that this museum is dedicated to preserving what's great about this country. We will do it as long as time goes on because things are changing in the world, as we all know, and this museum will always be the place that this history will be preserved honestly and truthfully. Okay, so. Let me get up here. I'm going to introduce you to a great man. And okay. <laughs> he asked if John was here. Well, I don't know, but don't tell him that to his face. Please, I have to live with the guy. OK. John Hug, many of you know John Hug and have known him for years as we have. He has taught thousands and thousands and thousands of students here over the years about his history. He um, has lectured many places about his, his history. Um, he flew B-17, he flew 17 combat missions during World War II in Asia, plus the multi-force show of strength over Tokyo Bay on Victory Day. Uh, over Japan, 1945. That's quite a legend. Um, he then, sp when he retired from the military, he spent 16 years in weather reconnaissance. He flew planes ranging from the North Pole to the Philippines and around Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Some of the work involved atomic air sampling. Weather Recon had John Hug flying converted B-29s, B-50s, and B-47 bombers. The planes received a W at the front of their names after modifications, like taking out refueling equipment not needed on the shorter, faster missions. He finished his military aviation career in C-130s. He piloted the big cargo of prop planes in the Vietnam War in 1968 and 1969. 
He retired as a lieutenant colonel at a base near Abilene, Texas in 1971. I'll let him tell you the rest of the story. So John, if you would please come up. <laughs> and we'll have questions and answers afterwards. I have to lift my feet over these cords. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Sue. That was quite an introduction for an old guy like me. I'll be 95 here in a couple of days. And so, I <laughs> this, this is my companion. I'm honored today to have my wife, Nalita, my uh, daughter, Donna, and her husband here today uh, to uh, listen to me rattle on about some of my military uh, life. I'm going to talk today on uh, hurricane hunting. I want that sheet of paper here. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dave. I've got a lot of things to read. You know, if I knew I was going to talk about hurricanes 60 years ago when I was flying them, uh, I'd saved a little more information. So a lot of this stuff I had to write down from memory, and, and uh, we chat about it. Idaho is a place that's out of mind, out of sight of out of mind, the old saying. Uh, many of you, how many of you have been in a hurricane where it hit? Quite a few. I'd say about 20-some. Well, they're no fun, and uh, I'm sure that when the hurricane hit where you were at, you would wish the hell you'd gotten out of there because they're pretty, pretty ferocious and a lot of people lose their lives. And I'm going into some of the statistics on that. <clears throat> uh, what is a hurricane? Uh, the, it's the, uh, simply it's the differences or changes of atmosphere pressure, atmospheric pressures or density which causes heat and moisture to form a cyclonic action. Simple, my, def my definition is a lot of wind and a hell of a lot of water. <laughs> the responsibility for uh, hurricanes for notification and so forth is the National Hurricane Center at Miami and Florida. And they're under the satellite program of uh, National Oceanic and, and Atmospheric Administration. And they have a satellite uh, some two, 400 miles above the Earth, and they can track the storms now, but there's a lot of information that's needed on hurricanes uh, that the satellite won't give you, such as direction, wind speed, which are two of the most important things. When I was flying these in Bermuda, uh, I went to Bermuda in 1952, and I had been instructing in B-29s. I've I got over, uh, over 7,000 hours in B-29s, by the way. Uh, I went there and uh, was, ended up as chief pilot when I first got over there because of my flying time. And uh, we've, the, uh, hurricane, uh, the hurricane people were stationed at Bermuda. And we called the Hur Hurricane Hunter Squadron, which is the 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron. <clears throat> we flew daily flights out of Hurricane South towards Puerto Rico, and incidentally, over that very, what they call a very dangerous area where all these airplanes had gone down. We never heard of it before, but we had daily flights over that. And you see it on television once in a while where they've lost so many airplanes in that particular part of the ocean. But uh, it never seemed to bother us. We had daily flights down to Puerto Rico. We operated out of Puerto Rico, sometimes Miami, depending on where the, the uh, storm was at. <clears throat> uh, tornadoes, typhoons, and hurricanes. In the northern equator, most of these, all of them are uh, counterclockwise direction. South of the equator, of course, they are in the opposite uh, direction. In um, 
wind speed in each tornadoes are much worse than hurricanes as far as damage goes. But it only occurs no, normally over city-wide, maybe 8, 10 miles wide. But hurricanes can end up at 500 miles wide where they do damage to the coastline and inland. Hurricanes have three killers. Winds over 200 miles an hour, flooding due to heavy rain, and storm surge. That storm surge is the worst one. And uh, my advice, and I think almost anybody's advice, if the hurricane's approaching and you think you're going to be in the path, get the heck out of there. Because you, most people wait too long. The hurricane ends up worse than they predicted. A lot of people are killed every year on, with hurricanes coming in where they could have gotten out of the road. The most dangerous thing on a hurricane, I'll mention, is water, this is storm surge. You take almost anywhere in the coast, of, uh, in the uh, Gulf or in the Atlantic, people build right on the, right on the rotter level, up a few feet off the sand, all along the coast. And when you have a storm surge come in, depending on how bad the storm is, it could be up to 12, 15 feet of surge. That'll wipe out most of them. Normally, they're not that high, but all, almost every year, storm surge takes out a lot of houses that are built right on the beach. Let's see, let's have a picture up here, see what we got first. <clears throat> Okay, I think I explained this here. These are the category the the uh, designer put on hurricanes, uh, one up to five on the miles per hour, and those miles per hour are only gained by hurricane reconnaissance by airplanes. <laughs> Satellite cannot provide the winds. So the satellite can provide the uh, direction the storm is going and the uh, speed or the velocity over a period of time of what, what the direction is. But the most important thing is, is uh, winds and storm surge. So when you speak of uh, hurricane being three, uh, category three, and then maybe a day or two later, all of a sudden it's four. This is what they're talking about here. Winds have increased quite a bit. <clears throat> Can we control hurricanes? The answer is no, not yet. I, I happened to be in, uh, when I was stationed in Bermuda, they tried silver iodide, dropping silver iodide right in the eye of a hurricane when it was off coast. Nothing happened. They used to, we had missions where we put balloons in the bomb bay of a B-29, released balloons inside the hurricane to see what the winds would do and whether they would winds, uh, think would, that was unsuccessful. They thought of even using atomic bombs, but uh, then the political ramifications came into effect on that one. Planes used, uh, the first airplane to ever go into a hurricane was an AT-6. Uh, I thought we had one in here, I guess. Anyway, a uh, fellow went into it, and I think he went back into it the same day the second time. And that was the first airplane to go into a hurricane. And from then on, they've been flying them. B-17s were used. Later on, B-29s, uh, WB-29s, WB-50s. And the difference between a 29 and a B-50 is that the 50 was, had bigger engines. It had the 4360s, which are... Uh, uh, 3,000 horsepower, 3,500 horsepower, excuse me. And uh, then they went to the uh, B-47, which was a jet. 
a lot of you people are familiar with the, the B-47. They've got a good article on them here in the, in the museum. The B-47 was my favorite airplane, mainly because the missions were short. They were only up to six hours, but all my B-50, B-29 time, my missions were 14 to 16 hours. And you kind of get tired of those after about 10 years of it. <clears throat> but that's where, where you really build up a lot of flying time. <clears throat> The problem with the B-47, it was not stressed for hurricane flying. And uh, it was only stressed for three Gs. The B-29, B-50 were stressed for 10. And when I first started flying hurricanes, I, I was pretty scared because I, you know, I was thinking the airplane's gonna fall apart because of tremendous up and down drafts. And sometimes it would take two people to hold the airplane. And you keep thinking, my God, it's going to pull the wings off. Well, I found out that the B-29 and the 50 were stressed for 10 Gs. And you or me are only stressed for about two or three. So we can, uh, we'll black out a long time before the airplane even thinks of coming apart. But after I learned that, I kind of dropped my fear attitude on penetrating into a hurricane because I knew uh, the airplane could take a hell of a lot more than I could. So I, if I could keep awake, keep in the airplane going, we could survive. <clears throat> Later on, I got into the uh, uh, B-47. I'll tell you about a mission on that later on. But it was very one of my most memorable. And the um, C-130, and of course that was the later airplane, and it's also stressed for 10 Gs. And we flew the E model, which have, uh, the last few years have been uh, exceeded by different later models that are much better. But I flew those in Vietnam for uh, two years also, the E model. The 130 is air conditioned. You've got real comfortable seats on it. So only a crew of three, uh, normally, unless you're carrying, have something to do with loads, and then you carry a load master with a few people to help load and unload airplanes, which we like in Vietnam. But the 130, again, is, is stressed for 10 Gs, and it's a much more comfortable airplane. Uh, the 130 c complied, or com They uh, gathered data recording every 10 and 30 second intervals. And this was transmitted back to Miami, which was the hurricane squad or hurricane center. And they, uh, they would analyze it and send out all over the world their, all your weather reports at every station, even Boise, everywhere in the world, it comes out of Miami. And they transmit that within minutes almost. <clears throat> Let's have another picture on it. Well, that was my hurricane card on that back one there. This is probably one of the only uh, pictures that I took, and this was at 500 feet. Now, in the old days, in 19, I'm talking old days, 1950 to 52, we used to penetrate at 500 feet off the water. And that's got one problem. Uh, you air crew members know what uh, barometric pressure is. You've worked with it. On, when you uh, penetrate into a hurricane, we usually did it from the southwest quadrant, which is normally the lightest winds. As the hurricane is moving the water, it's compressing the air ahead of it, and the isobars, if you're familiar with isobars, uh, are, are getting closer and closer, and the closer they get, the more wind you have on the... Uh, uh, Penetration, it's, uh, we used to do it in the, in the quadrant that was, we'd get the least turbulence. And there's one quadrant in a hurricane that you never went into because it would just almost tear you apart. And that's the one where it's pushing forward in the direction of travel. When you're, pen when you're flying and penetrating into the, country, into the uh, hurricane, you're getting precise information and geographical locations. And uh, we would go in, penetrate the eye, 
and get barometric pressure readings and so forth, usually circle, climb in the eye up to 10,000 feet and drop a drop sign. I think I've got a picture of one of those later on. Give me another picture. This is just, uh, it's hard to see, but you can see a little white froth on the water. Winds at that time were about 125 miles an hour on the surface. And that's our weatherman right in the front of the B-29. Okay, next picture. This, this is, shows some waves of, uh, of uh, the storm as, as we're going into the eye. Go ahead, another picture here. This gives you a, bur and all of you have seen these on television. This happens to be a hurricane off of Yucatan. I don't even remember the year, but it shows you approximately where it was at in Hawaii. And you can see it's counter rotation. And uh, if it's north of the equator, it'll be counter, counter rotation direction. Those, that particular area there, compared to the Florida, uh, you can tell it, it covers about, it, it probably covers uh, five to 600 miles wide. And that's where you get into the lot of damage and, uh, when it hits landfall. Next picture. This is a uh, uh, B-29 that was used for for a hurricane, you can see it still has the turrets on it, but it, they, uh, when they got into weather service, they took the turrets off of it. Next picture. And that's the B-50. Now, they look alike, except the engines are quite a few more horsepower. Uh, we had tip tanks for extra fuel, and that that's, happens to be a gunship also, so that's not a, actually a weather, uh, weather B-50. If, if the W is in front of it, it's been notified for weather. Next. That's the B-47. So it's a six-engine jet, very fast airplane. And uh, it, I'll tell you a story of flying that. That was my favorite airplane. I got about uh, 2,000, 2,500 hours in that, and I really, really loved it. That particular airplane killed a lot of people because it was very unforgiving. And it would fly, if you held that straight and level with full throttles, it would keep increasing airspeed till the wings came off. And when I went through the B-47 school, uh, my instructor, on my last ride with my instructor, said, I want to show you something that you'll probably never forget it, which I haven't. But he, at, uh, we were six or 7,000 feet, and he just pushed the throttles on up to 100%. And I just saw that old airspeed kept rising and rising. It got up to 425 indicated, and he said, now watch this. He took the aileron, and the aileron is a half of a wheel like it is in a lot of the airplanes. <laughs> he took that aileron, racked it clear over as far as it go against the stop, and the airplane just kept flying level. Other way, didn't change the airplane at all. And he said, now look out at the wingtips. That wing just curled like that. And I said, that's enough. <laughs> My God, that scared the hell out of me. You know, just that whole wing of that airplane just twisted, and it kept flying straight. So that, that airplane was capable of, like I say, flying until the wings came off of it. So 425 was the fastest it was actually a little faster than what you had control of it. Okay, next airplane. That's, uh, that's a bomber airplane there. Put the gear down. This is a WC-130. That's the one we use as of today. And it's a very good airplane, very comfortable airplane to fly. Got a lot of room in it. And... Uh, is capable of doing their mission. <clears throat> In uh, 52, I mentioned that we had pen used to penetrate at 500 feet off the water. If it started, if it rained, and it always was raining, uh, if it rained hard enough where you could not keep inside of the water, you had to climb your rules where you climbed to 1,500 feet and leveled off. Nowadays, the new, the new procedure on the new uh, hurricane squanders now, they, they penetrate at 1,500. The reason for that is, of the, uh, uh, the reason for that 
is the B, uh, your air pr your barometric pressure drops so rapidly when you're penetrating into the eye that if somebody doesn't keep adjusting your altitude uh, altimeter, the pilot's altimeter, you're going down, but you don't know it. And at 500 feet, the weatherman who was stationed in the nose of the B-29 and B-50 would just lean back, turn around, and, and keep adjusting the altimeter for the pilot because he had two radar altimeters that gave him exact altitude above the water. But we lost an airplane in the Pacific uh, in uh, the Typhoon because of that. I think that the, they didn't adjust that altimeter often enough and the guy just flew right into the water. If you fly, many of you have flown over water and you know if you're flying down to within a couple hundred feet off the water, for a period of time you lose, you lose that power to, to recognize elevation. And you can just get slower and lower and lower until you fly into the water. It's a, a very funny feeling, but it's uh, over water flying at low altitude is very dangerous. <clears throat> I had the privilege of briefing Edward R. Murrow, and like old timers always all knew him uh, in Bermuda on a hurricane flight. And uh, I didn't get to fly him, but I wish I could have. But uh, very nice gentleman, and as you know, he had a cigarette in his mouth all the time. And uh, I put my best pilots, of course, aboard the airplane, but they had a very uneventful mission, but he got to fly a hurricane, and he had it on his program the very next night in New York on See It Now. Some of you might have seen that program. That was one of my most memorable things in there. Worst storm. I want to mention uh, I was had climbed to 1,500 feet on a penetration and uh, we hadn't got into the eye, and we're going in on it, and this is on a uh, B-29. And my navigator called me, he said, John, you've got to make a turn one way or another. He said, we've been sitting still here for 10 minutes. And he had navigation, he had uh, radar navigation, the old, uh, uh, can't remember the name of the set, but uh, it was very accurate. But we were actually sitting up there in 200 mile an hour winds, which is the basic speed of the B-29, and sitting still. So I got, went back out of, the, out of the storm and took my brave pill, turned around and I went right back into it. But uh, it's, some of those things are very weird, and it's, and it's funny when you can't feel or see what the airplane's doing. You're on instruments, and you're doing what the navigator tells you and what your instruments tell you. It's not like you're flying at a certain airspeed over a place where you can have something on the ground that you can judge speed or altitude. But when you're on the gauges, it's a little different situation, and you have to depend on your navigator for your, for your directions. <clears throat> flying a hurricane on the ground. In Bermuda, the base weather uh, gives the order to evacuate the base if he deems that the hurricane is going to come over the island. Well, he said it wasn't going to come that close to the island. And for, unfortunately, we waited long enough where we couldn't get the airplanes off the ground because of the winds. And we had to get out and get our airplanes crewed up, not to fly, but to, to weather out the storm because the damn storm came right over. and we put the brakes on the airplane, loaded them down with fuel, and put them into the wind. And you'd release your brakes about every five to seven or eight minutes, and the airplane would move into the direction of the wind with a high tail. It would go right into the wind. My airspeed indicator on the panel, without the props turning, 135 miles an hour. And that's, that's flying speed for a B-29. And that thing, <laughs> it just felt so light on the wings when those winds were buffeting out there. But we sat through that storm and kept 
And the tower, I remember the tower bailed out when the winds got to 110 because it, it was blowing water right through those doggone wind, uh, wind seals they had up in the uh, tower. They evacuated it. But uh, it was very interesting. We talked to the other B-29 guys on the ground, and here we were flying that airplane with the engines not running on the ground. And uh, that was a real experience, sitting through that hurricane. Of course, you always leave the wives at home and go to work, you know, and you let them worry about themselves. Most beautiful. In a B-47, I was flying out of Savannah, Georgia, and uh, the B-47, as you know, we couldn't penetrate into the eye at low altitude because of the turbulence. They were only stressed for three Gs. So uh, this particular one, I was flying at night, and uh, I was at 39,000, and I got over the center of the hurricane, and you could look down on that eye like that picture of that storm I showed a while ago. This happens to be a drop sawn operator or weather officer. Uh, you could look down, but the eye was open at 39. Now this was, picture here was taken 400 miles high or something. But at 39,000, I could see the eye down there, and it was so clear in moonlight that night, I swore I could see the water. It was just the most beautiful sight I've ever seen. And I wanted to call my buddy ham operator and have him get on the radio and put it out over the air. And I thought about it twice. I said, God, the old man will can me if I do that. So I didn't do it. But I sought that out for years, and I wish I had done it now. OK, that's it. Any questions? No questions. He caught me by surprise. That's the fastest anyone's you're, ever quit. Uh, you, somebody's going to have to help me because I can't hear. When do you decide to cut into the head, the head towards the face? Let me, John, let me go up here and I'll have him speak into the mic, okay? okay? And then we'll, when then. When did you decide to penetrate? Yeah. What determined? Oh, oh he's talking. Oh. Okay. How fast do you have to be going to cut into the eye of the hurricane? Well, in the southwest quadrant, is the lightest winds. And uh, the, we, all the airplanes that I flew, all the three or four that I flew in hurricanes, we went in at the uh, regular cruise speed. We didn't adjust airspeed at all on the airplane. And uh, normally in the southwest quadrant, uh, you might have winds at uh, uh, 80, 90 knots. But in the airplane, you don't know the the winds. You have to read that off of Doppler or navigation equipment that shows you what you're drifting or position of the airplane's drifting. Another Any question? other questions? I'll come down here to you. Somebody else had a question? Yes, right here. North. Just a second. Coming from the East Coast, there's a lot of hurricanes through the year. How come the Pacific, which is bigger than the Atlantic, how comes there's no storms like that out here in the West? Well, that's easy. You got more water. They form over water, and I didn't have I didn't have a map with me on this presentation. It showed all the hurricanes one or two over two years that developed in the uh, Atlantic, and they were all far east of Puerto Rico. In fact, a lot of them over near the coast of Africa, where they first started forming. And we got the, uh, we got, we were aware of those when we were running daily missions out of Bermuda, because uh, we were going down almost to Puerto Rico, and, and we had a triangular course there that we could pick up any variation in pressure. Okay, yeah, that shows. I, I don't know whether you can read that from back there, but... <clears throat> they gave the number of positions, and the positions here on the left side of the number, 
and uh, this shows the date on them, so I, I won't go into those. But those are the tracks, and you see where most of them form over in the, in the uh, uh, far east part, just off of Africa. Those hardly didn't heat the east coast at all, but I'm sure the warnings were up. Any other questions? I don't really have a question. I just wanted to answer, answer this gentleman's question. In the Pacific, you still have super typhoons, not hurricanes, but most of the time they form a few degrees north of the equator and move east to west into the Asia. I didn't, I, I and, didn't follow it. On the equator, what? A few degrees north of the equator. We didn't go south of the equator. No. But, I mean, two, most of the typhoons form a few degrees north of the TA well, in the northern hemisphere and move yeah. westward into uh, the Philippines and the Chinese coast and Japan yeah. and that area. I was stationed north of the equator in all my overseas duties, so it, I didn't get anything lower. No, no. That's all north in the northern hemisphere. Can you tell me what he's – I can't make out what he's saying. He's just making a comment, John. He's not asking a question. Oh. He was just commenting on, on what you had to say. Uh-huh. Yeah. Question. Yeah, he was answering a, a he was yeah. He was expanding on the first the, the other guy's questions. Okay. Question over here? Yes. Okay. I don't think he can hear too well from this, so you'll need to repeat the questions. Okay. Uh, two things. One uh, when I was stationed in Amarillo Air Force Base back in uh, the late 60s, there were four F-4 Phantoms. I think it was four or six of them. They the, all had weather painted on their tail. Would you have any idea why those F-4 Phantoms would have weather? No. <laughs> One of my favorite airplanes, but I never flew it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was often wondered that uh, if it was just... Um, diversionary, then maybe they had some other reason for them to have weather on them. Not in my knowledge. They weren't in weather reconnaissance. Yes, question over here. I just wondered how many planes were lost and how many people were lost doing this job. Well, we lost one in the Pacific uh, when I was stationed at Bermuda, and there was one other one lost, and they don't know whatever happened. When the plane goes into a storm, and that's the last you hear of it, you don't have any idea what happened to others. Airplane failure, uh, hurricane, uh, bad weather, something that happened to it, but they just disappeared. And they, they sent up search missions for days and never found a trace of it. John, uh, oh yeah, okay. Um, we, when I was in the Navy, I was on a destroyer, and we went, you know, once a year we went over to Westpac, and we would average about six typhoons and nine gales each time we went. We very seldom walked on the on the deck. We were on the bulkheads all the time, uh, you know, rocking up to sixty degrees and things like that, and. But I just wondered, uh, now, they ha we had some really interesting hurricanes. It was, we got into the eye one time that I remember, and it was very nice and calm. And then, so we enjoyed ourselves for a while, while, while that, uh, we were waiting to get out of it. But, but this was all in the, the North and South China Sea, and uh, mostly uh, around uh, Formosa, or Taiwan, as they call it now. Were you in that uh, one that Halsley lost two ships? No, no, but that was, that was before they learned how to ballast their ships. Well, yeah. I, I was flying missions in Japan, and when we were returning from a mission, we were, got in the edge of that hurricane. And that's before I had any hurricane experience. But in, in B-29s, and 
you just charge on through it because you're, the airplane normally will take it. But we weren't in the eye or anything. But Halsley lost two air, or two ships and crew on that one from Japan. And that particular storm, uh, we had so much water on Tinian where I was stationed. Uh, I had pictures of guys swimming to the mess hall. It was four feet deep. <laughs> Well, that must have been great tasting food. Andy, you have a question. Not a question, but a comment. If you look in the dictionary, you will find that in defining a hurricane and a typhoon, the, the, they say the same thing, only difference is that they qualify a hurricane on the East Coast and or in on the Atlantic, and a typhoon is in the in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. They name them typhoons in the Pacific, hurricanes in the East, and uh, typhoons are much bigger, larger in in uh, diameter, and they're much more dangerous with higher winds because they have more water, warm water, to uh, to uh, uh, generate. And that's what they do over water. They generate. OK? Yes. One more comment, then we'll let you all go. This is it. My father was stationed in Okinawa right after World War II. And he was the port officer at Naha. And we had a typhoon come in while we were there. I was about six years old at the time. And we lived in Quonset huts. Those, that was all that was left on that island. That island burned from one end to the other, so there was nothing left. So our Quonset hut was on the side of a hill, held down by two cables. And uh, we spent six hours under those cables <laughs> during one typh the first half of the typhoon. My father drove home in a Jeep, picked us up, we went out to as close as we could get to the ocean during the eye, we went back, got back under the bed, and uh, my dad left to go back down to, uh, to Naha, and uh, we got to spend the next six hours going through that typhoon. We heard later, at least this is what I remember, something around one of the worst ever 200 mile an hour winds, and whatever was left after the war that hadn't been blown away was blown away during that. <laughs> it was really, really something. Well, it's proved, it's proved that uh, if you're in a brick home or concrete, you're, you usually can weather the storm. But if you're in a wooden framed house and a storm hits directly, you're in a bad, bad way. And uh, I've... Uh, I've had to sit out a few of myself, but we were, I was in modern homes. And I think the winds only got up to a little over 100 miles an hour. We were floating under the... <laughs> well, you're one of the very few that have experienced a hurricane. Yeah, I lived in Yokohama, Japan in 1956, and I was 10 years old. No, I was 12 years old, and a typhoon hit. And I was com coming home from school, and I remember running. I thought it was the funnest thing I'd ever been in because I had to hold on to a telephone pole and then gauge how long it would take me to get to where that gas station was, that gas thing there. And then I'd let go, and I'd be blown way over, and I'd fight my way back and come back and I'd hold on. and. My mother was livid when I got home. I thought it was really fun. Let's thank John Hug. Isn't he incredible? This man went from flying during World War II to flying in Vietnam, and then, of course, this incredible experience. Thank you so much, John. That's great. He'll be here if you have more questions. Just go up and ask. I want you guys to see what we're putting on the table. This is our Vietnam series. Any of you that don't have one of these, please uh, grab what's on the table, or we have tons of them as you go out. It'll tell you what dates each one of the uh, series will exist and what it's about. It's fantastic, so, and it's free to the public. So please come. Bring anyone you'd like with you that you think would like it. Uh, we're just starting to promote now our Warbird Roundup, which is the last weekend in June. 
June. We're going to have a Cobra here, an LV-10 here, about six or eight Mustangs are going to be here, P-40s, everything will be flying. It'll be a very exciting day. And our guest speaker is going to be um, Joe Galloway, who wrote the book, uh, We Were Soldiers Once and Young. He was in, uh, in that battle, and a movie was made with Mel Gibson called We Were Soldiers Once. He, he'll be our guest speaker both days. There is a chance, and we'll let you know for sure, that we'll have the uh, F-86 Sabre jet and the um, MiG-15 fly in for the show also. So I'll keep you updated on that. But it's going to be a great show. It is the major fundraiser for the museum, so there's you know, this, the admission to come in to see it. The rest of these with Vietnam is all free. So please come and if you're interested in, in Vietnam and... Uh, let us honor those veterans from that war and also teach those of you that weren't there what the war was. Okay, you're, as, as a teacher would say, you're free to go.